you lost your father at the, I don't know, how, were you a baby? You must have been a baby. I was five months old. Yeah. You were five months old when your father died killing the fascists who were killing Trying the Jews to. of Europe. Yeah. So your father gave up his life and you had no, a childhood with no father because he was, he signed up in the British, uh, was it the uh, RAF? The No, he was in the army. He was a royal in, fusilier. Yeah. And, um, and died in the war, a war to, to stop Hitler. Um, so I think whenever I hear you talk about this, it's always in the back of my mind remembering that you have a certain standing in this, that, that at five months old, you had to have the sacrifice of losing your father, trying to stop Nazis and fascists and, uh, and anti-Semites and people um, hell-bent on eradicating the Jewish people off the face of the earth. So um, with that in mind, I, I really want you to share um, and, and explain to people, because on the American news, we don't see anything about this issue anymore. So I'd really love for you to, to speak well, personally to him. Well, I should just, my father was a conscientious objector at the beginning of the war because he was communist. He had become, he was, devoutly Christian. And that's why he, when the conscription board came to him and said, right, you've got to join the army. He said, I can't kill anyone. I'm a Christian. And they said, I said, and eventually they believed that he might not be malingering, which of, of course he wasn't. And he had spent some time in the Holy Land before then. He was a school teacher as well as being a devout Christian. And he had taught at St. George's School in Jerusalem in 1934 and five and six before he came back to England before the war. So he knew a lot about the Middle East and having lived there. So, um, so they said, well, you could, will you do other war work? He said, I'll do anything so long as I don't have to kill people. And uh, so he drove uh, an ambulance in in London through the Blitz. That's where he met my mother. That's where he started getting political. That's where, And then in 1942, he he thought it all through and he thought, I, I can't do this. I, I have to go and fight the Third Reich. Like they, they are monsters and I have to do my, so he went back and he said, I've changed my mind, sir. Oh, jolly good. Listen, you've got a university degree, officer material. So he did six weeks of basic training and then another, however long you do, and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in this put together um, regiment from London called the Royal Fusiliers. And then he brushed off to um, it immediately to North Africa, and then straight into Anzio uh, in January. He arrived in Anzio in, in January of 1944, on the 10th of January, and he was killed on February the 22nd. Anyway, so that's his story, which is- How, how, was, he, how was he killed? Uh, he, he was in a front, he was in Z, Z Company, 8th Battalion, Royal Fusiliers, and um, he was commanding a platoon uh, that happened to be in the very front lines uh, the night that, uh, however many panzer divisions it was, attacked the front lines to try and break through and knock the bridgehead back into the sea. And they were told, I actually wrote a song about it, which talks about, you know, how they were, they asked for permission to uh, withdraw because they were being overrun, their positions were being overrun. And they were told, no, you bloody well stay there and fight as long as you can. And they did, and they were all killed or captured. Most of them were killed. Mm. And um, so that's how he died, um, fighting tanks, you know, with a with a Bren gun or a, or a Lee Enfield 303 um, in a foxhole. Um yeah, so that so that that was kind of the end the end of his story. How does that relate to me in Palestine? Not much, except that after the war, I'm, my mother moved to Cambridge and I'm brought up there. And we and we had we had one particular friend who was called Claudette. She was a she was a sweet woman, but haunted desperately because um, she had been in Auschwitz for four years, and the reason she survived is because she was a doctor. 
And the only way she could, could survive was to help Mengele with his fucking experiments. You know, so, I mean, I, I remember these people just after the war and, oh my, you know, it was it was kind of terrifying to be around them. And, of course, because my mother was so political and so involved in good works and blah, 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 inevitably there was that book in the bottom drawer with pictures of what Belson looked like when the Americans went in and tore the gates down and things. I'm getting a bit emotional. No, no. No, no. This is all, I think to me, it's all part and parcel. Okay, well, of, so, of how did you become who you are, and in, in the in your infancy, um, in your childhood? Well, then, well, then, there, there, there's that. So, and I remember Claudette's tattoo, you know, and um, I the was, number the Germans tattooed on her. Yeah, tattooed. Every everybody in Auschwitz had a had a number tattooed on them, and and it's you know, no Jewish person anywhere in the world would not know that or would not know about it, or would not know somebody whose uncle or aunt or grandparent or co was one of those people because there were six million of them. There were also, you know, six million communists, or and uh, you know, and three million gypsies and whatever. But obviously, the the biggest crime of all, though, how how you compare crimes like that, I don't, I don't know. Was was the Jewish people who were murdered, slaughtered? Anyway, um, so after the war, so I grow up, and um, then I then I I'm, I'm sort of get involved a little bit in politics because. My mum was a working school teacher, so when she went out in the evenings to um, political meetings, she, she would take me. I had an older brother, John, my brother John, who's still alive, I'm happy to say. Um, she would take us both um, with her to a British China Friendship Association meetings at the Friends, you know, at the Quaker, at the Friends Meeting House where the Quakers um, held their services in Cambridge. Because the Quaker community were always extremely welcoming to, they didn't, couldn't care less about faiths or religions or whatever. They just, they believed in their particular version of Christianity. And they were very, my mother once, I remember once coming away from there and she said, now Roger, you do know where we were tonight, do you? And I said, um, yeah, we were at a meeting. And she said, no, 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 the building. I said, isn't it called the Friends House or something? Said, yes, it is. It's called the Friends Meeting House. It's run by the Quakers. They're a religious group. They're Christians. And she said, you know, I'm an atheist myself. I can't subscribe to their religious beliefs, but I want you to always remember this. She said, they are very, very good people. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. <laughs> You know, so it was. They are very, very good people. That the important thing about people is not what damn religion they are; it's how much heart they've got, whether they care about yeah. other people or not, whether they have empathy. You know, whether whether their love extends beyond their grandmother or their whatever. How can is your heart big enough that you can love somebody who is from another tribe? Can you or can't you? Obviously, it's something that, as far as we know, there may have been somebody called Christ in you know the first century AD who believed that because it's all over the New Testament. But you know, so so this was sort of dinned into me as as a child, and but it it hit a spot where um it stuck. So I've always so blah 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 blah, and then you know a bit of um. Debates at school. This house um, supports the idea of a world government. It's the only debate I ever spoke in. I was fascinated when I was watching this interview with Bertrand Russell the other night. And when he was 82 years old, somebody asked him, What are the three? Uh, is there, what would you do if you had control of the world? He's, and he said, There are three things that are paramount. And number one is world government. <laughs> that mm. was. This was in 1950, I don't know when, probably six or seven or eight, something like that. World, and, world government. Uh -huh. Yeah, world government. Sure. You know, sure. Yeah, you have to have a, a kind of, a, some kind of federal system yeah. and based loosely upon the idea of the League of Nations or to look at later history upon the United Nations. So going back again to 1948. 
But there is no question but that we cannot have a unipolar world. We've seen what happens when one country thinks it can dominate everybody else, i.e. the Third Reich. Right. You have a world war. We've seen it happen now. We know what happens. And it is a disaster. And this is why these days now are so dangerous, is that we have a unipolar world where the United States thinks it has the right just because it's richer and has got more guns and bombs and airplanes and nuclear weapons than it, that it can dominate the rest of the world and tell everybody what to do, which is the most disgusting political philosophy, well, certainly since 1933, um, in Mein Kampf. It's disgusting. And I've, I, mean, I have no compunction in saying that. Oh, but we're saving the world for democracy and free. No, you're not. You don't give a shit about any of those things. You've shown that to be true. You've shown you just showed it just now by supporting the coup in Bolivia. You're trying to destroy Venezuela. You know, trying to destroy the the Simon the Bolivarian Revolution and to, the 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 building of a democratic free democracy in this beautiful big country that just happens to have a lot of oil under the surface. Anyway, I'm I'm sorry, I'm getting diverted, and I don't. No, mean- no, it's not. No, I think this is all. This is all prelude to who you are and and why you came to believe the way the world should be and and how you are so distraught and personally offended by the treatment of people. And he called the Palestinians. Well, but any, I mean, the Palestinians, but, yes. yeah, but I say to people all the time, it doesn't matter to me if you're Palestinian or Rohingya or or Ingwar or this or that or the other or any of the thousands, hundreds, millions of indigenous people who've been slaughtered all over the world since the 15th century. It doesn't matter. It's wrong. Genocide is wrong. So anyway. so and I And I believe that as one who... If if what happened back in the 40s, the 30s and 40s ever happened again, I would want every Jewish person to know that there is there will be at least one one non-Jewish person that will have your back. I will fight to the death to make sure nothing ever happens to you again. I will have your back. You need to know that about me. But that position has no credibility if I am not willing to say that to a Palestinian, to a Chilean. To a, a Cuban, to anybody uh, in this world, absolutely. If you are going to start segregating out those who you would support their their right to live, but not support others' right to live, how can you have any credibility when you say, "Well, I, I support Israel. I support the Jewish people." Oh, really? Not. Well, I don't think you do because I. If you can't support that right for everybody, then and you only support it for a certain person or a group of people, the the bigotry of that, the inherent bigotry of that is so obvious that you don't even know what you're talking about at that point. 